Consortium. So Zika Plan stands for the Zika Preparedness Latin American Network. And those who are part of Zika Plan, can you please put up your hands? So there are quite a few here. Anna Durbin, you're part of it too. So <laughs> she's our ethicist at, 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 uh, in Zika Plan. So we are three EU-funded um, consortia, SIG Action, Zika Plan, and Zika Alliance. And together, we share about 30 million uh, euros. So that is quite a bit of money and responsibility. I, I want to draw your attention to the timelines. So you see the problem. So the, the, the PHEIC was declared, I remember like today, on the 1st of February 2016. The call for proposals came in that month. The deadline was in April. So we all worked together, or also against each other, to, uh, to put, a, put a good consortia together. The review, uh, review was finalized in July, and the starting date was only in October. And some, and Zika Alliance even got their money far later. So we have a funding problem. This is not a good model for a PHEIC, and we need to do better. Because by October 2016, we were already at a time when the peak was over and, and, and basically entering the Zika epidemic at the time of decline. Um, so the beauty of working with the three a Zika consortium is then that we also uh, work on, on the clinical cohort studies together. So you increase your sample size and you increase your uh, geographic outreach. And I must acknowledge that Zika Alliance here is really contributing a large proportion of those clinical sites to us. <coughs> um, so, um, but as you can imagine, bringing them three consortia together to also took a lot of time to ensure that we would harmonize the protocol standardize the tools, have um, uh, set up reciprocal clinical monitoring platforms and develop joint analysis plans. This reads well. In reality, this took so much effort and many tears and sweat. And so, but this is, this is part of life. So um, we, we, we um, there, there are also differences between the, the Zika consortia, which I would like to highlight. Both Zika Alliance and Zika Action recruit all women um, regardless whether they have symptoms or not. Whereas we in Zika plan, we opted to only uh, recruit symptomatic, those with a rash, uh, pregnant women. Clear, clearly with this approach that we have in Zika plan, we cannot address the important question of the symptomatic to asymptomatic ratio, nor address the question whether asymptomatically infected mothers have less or more severe kind of range of congenital uh, Zika syndrome. However, the benefit of our approach, obviously, is our yield is much higher. So our cost effectiveness is much better. And in fact, we have now probably have the best, uh, the largest uh, children's cohort, um, I think, in the world uh, under, under Zika plan. Zika Alliance is very strong in virology. I, when, when I started putting the consortium together, when I called a virologist, they said, no, no, I'm Zika Alliance. And OK, so I thought I'll, I had to plan my, my consortium differently. So they're very strong. In, in virology, uh, but all of but uh, Zika Alliance and Zika Plan, we share the entomology, we do the modeling, and we have a lot of seroprevalence um, uh, studies. All of us were asked by, by the EU to work also on preparedness uh, network plans. Um, I would also like to highlight that under the, the guidance of WHO, they, um, they um, are coordinating an, an IPD meta-analysis so that, that together with these large cohorts and the US-based ZIP cohorts and various other cohorts of, uh, around the world where that all data come together and not analyzed on an aggregate level but on, in, on an individual level. So one of the really important uh, uh, questions that we have that's not only important for epidemiologists but also what we communicate as risk to, to the affected populations but also the factors that you need to know when you make a business case for vaccine development is what are the attack rates. The symptomatic to asymptomatic ratio in, in non-maternal, so in, in, in non-maternal Zika infections is always reported to be around 80 to 20%. In pregnant women, it was still unclear. The Guillain-Barré syndrome is, uh, is now we have more data on the, on the true risk, and I will show that to you in a second. And it was also often the, you know, what is, what is the true a spectrum of clinical uh, congenital uh, Zika syndrome, mm -hmm. and what is the proportion of microcephaly? Everyone talks about the tip of the iceberg, but how big is the tip of this iceberg? 
So we, we actually did a, a systematic review and, and, and all the initial studies were retrospective studies, um, so they are biased and skewed towards um, more microcephaly, more women with rash, and, and the poor case definition. So, so you really have to, to rely only, you can only rely really on prospective studies. And while we are waiting for, for our Zika consortium uh, prospective studies, I think the US um, Zika birth cohort studies have probably, or registries have probably done a very good job because this is a prospective study to enroll all women who went to travel, pregnant women, who went to travel to Zika endemic countries who were then Zika lab confirmed Zika infections. And there were three progress pro, uh, prospective studies, um, um, in, uh, including um, invo having involved uh, between 442 and above 2,500 pregnant women. And as you can see, what um, was already said today, about half of, of the of maternal Zika infections are symptomatic and about 6% of symptomatic infections results in congenital Zika syndrome and the same amount for asymptomatic infections, maternal infections. So this is important information, as we already said, and, and uh, Anna Durbin uh, highlighted it. What are the implications? Well, all pregnant women need to be screened if they live in Zika endemic countries or are going to Zika endemic countries because the risk is basically equal for congenital Zika syndrome. It also sets the, the, the bar very high for vaccine development as we probably need to be able to reduce even low amounts of viremia. Uh, but really for the full spectrum of clinical congenital Zika syndrome, you need these prospective studies where you, where you enroll these, um, these children. So we have um, in Zika plan, we enroll prospectively to all women born to into laboratory confirmed um, Zika infected mothers. And that we also do case control where we just enroll anyone with microcephaly and have a case control uh, approach. And then we have a very rigorous and systematic standardized approach that we share the protocols with the other consortia where we look for various parameters to define the, the full spectrum. Here, I do not want to already say what is the overall proportion of microcephaly. I think we should wait. We've uh, seen, uh, have seen increasing evidence that that some children who, who are uh, born with severe defects actually improve. Remember, there's lots of brain plasticity. But also, children who are born totally normal um, may, may present a few months later with epilepsy or other problems. So I think we still need to be open for the whole uh, spectrum. Hearing loss and, 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 and visual deficits are now well described, but I think what we don't know are, 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 are minimal deficits that will probably turn up later in the development. So our um, uh, follow-up time is, is uh, four years. Um, and remember, lots of other things are happening like dysphagia, even, even probably even endocrine disorders. They often, these children are actually quite obese um, and, and other issues. And epilepsy is definitely another issue that is of major concern. So for GBS, we learned a lot during the French Polynesia outbreak. And as said, there are phenotypically some differences to, to uh, GBS um, um, as a result of other pathogens. And uh, first of all, the, the, the interval to, to, the, to the infection is a bit shorter. Secondly, um, they very, have a very high rate of um, facial palsy. Um, initially, it was thought to be mainly AMAN, but now we've also seen other, other uh, neurophysiological uh, features. Uh, but clearly, uh, uh, GBS is a severe disease. It's, it's a long-lasting disease. You know, 57% were able to walk without assistance after three months. So this is, this is, a, this is a real problem. GBS is also a very good um, 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 alert or indicator of an ongoing problem because it's almost in it's, it's clearly in temporal association. So you can almost see these waves of GBS coming with the Zika outbreaks as the outbreaks occurred. But GBS remains a rare disease. So the, the, incident, the attack rate is about one out of 5,000 to one out of 10,000. So, and the other thing is we have initially focused too much on GBS as have we have uh, focused too much maybe on microcephaly, but we know there's some other diseases. So here is a, is a traveler, older man who presented with a rash, uh, febrile, comatose, hemiplegia, and it was um, a CSF, and a CSF was positive for, for Zika PCR. Here, a young girl presenting with acute hemiparesis 
um, and, and, and has an acute myelitis due to Zika, virus infections. So there, there is a, a range, again, of neurological problems assumed to be associated with Zika infection that are related to the PNS as well to the CNS. So we talked about encephalitis, myelitis, optic neuritis, but also an autoimmune phenomenon called ADEM, acute disseminating encephalomyelitis. And then we have uh, neuropathies, sensory neuropathies, et cetera. And the question is, is this direct immune mediated or is it direct uh, viral um, pathogenicity? So really is it direct infection, is it para-infectious, is it post-infectious, autoimmune mediated? So we are, we are trying to address this, the Zika plan. So Zika plan is the only consortium that has a large proportion of um, neurologists and, and neuro lab people working on the neuro Zika uh, problem looking. And so the way to go to answer these questions for a very rare problem is you cannot do prospective studies for one out of 10,000. So you have to use case control studies. So you have to enroll literally every GBS patient or everyone with, uh, with a neurological syndrome and then, and, then, and then diagnose. So interestingly, as we are doing this now, we see a lot of pathology, due, an unusual pathology due to dengue and chikungunya and other viruses that we did not think about. So this is our network that we are using in Colombia, 10 hospitals to recruit patients with neurological complications. And then, um, and then we send the samples for further characteristics. So really, we want to find out the neurotropism. How is, the, is, is there a neural receptor? If there's a neural receptor, then there may be also um, an, a drug intervention. Is it totally autoimmune mediated? What is the full spectrum of rare complications? So this is Zika plan's oval structure. I've talked about um, our, our pregnant women court studies with the children about the neuroclinical and the neurobasic science. And I would now, and, and today we heard about invades and Michael Gaunt is, uh, is leading this, this work package. And I think tomorrow you will hear um, from, from Louis Lombrecht about, about viral fitness and, and, and mosquito issues. So I would now like to draw an, your attention to this platform that we are developing. And I'm really excited about this. So when Zika came, there was, I mean, dozens or hundreds of companies, academics uh, rushed into developing uh, diagnostic tests. But what was the main problem? The bottleneck was actually access to well-characterized, ethically obtained, GLP compliant um, um, samples. And that was the bottleneck and that hampered the whole development. So we in Zika Plan thought instead of developing our own number 100 kind of essay that will never make it to the market, let's develop a platform that enables the global community to have access to, to samples. So Rosa Peel, Rosanna Peeling, who led the evaluation platform in the past and at WHO now leads the International Diagnostic Center in London, she's leading this platform. And really, so what we're doing is setting up a biobank of well-characterized samples with a very strict governance and the guiding principles of governance as being transparent, what we have, being fair, so allowing equal access by the public and private sectors, so that not just one rich company buys off all our precious samples, but that we are, there's a there's uh, kind of a fairness system in selecting those um, companies that we feel have the best um, um, prospect. Um, and also respect for national laws with regard to transport. So as we all know, you could not uh, export uh, Zika samples out of Brazil at the time. And uh, so we decided for a decentralized uh, biobanking system, so a virtual biobanking system to maximize contributions and minimize transport and also contribute to capacity building. So Rosanna has a steering committee that provides oversight with regard to the inventory, what do we have, requests for reference pa uh, materials and panels, requests for evaluations or access to collection and evaluation sites. And as you know, there's this whole quality cascade in diagnostics, right, you know, from the design to, to the stage of approval, to making it available, procurement, etc., to the real use. And each of them need panels. So we, we are now really trying to develop panels as reference panels and validation panels, evaluation panels, to make sure that they get to approval stage 
and then hopefully in future we will also work on verification and proficiency panels. Um, so the biobanking, as I said, is decentralized. And what we wanted was an, uh, um, a background of different flavivirus exposure. So because the flavivirus exposure in Africa will be different to the one in Latin America, and that will drive the sensitivity and specificity, your basic your evaluation of your tests. So we have an African site, we have two Latin American sites, and we have the Swiss travelers who then have provide a lot of total negative, really control samples, or a, a clearly uh, um, 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 characterized dengue or Zika or past the um, uh, yellow fever vaccination sample, et cetera. So, so we have uh, access to these samples, uh, develop protocols, uh, and, the, and, then, uh, and then we're doing also monitoring of these evaluation sites, and then requests can come in for evaluations. <coughs> the other part work practice I'm really excited about is work practice eight is on disease burden and risk assessment. And here we are working with Butantan as our partner. And uh, in fact, Alessandra Preciosa is leading this. Um, thank you. <laughs> and so here we're benefiting from the ongoing dengue vaccine trial that Butantan is doing in 17,000, 16,000 um, subjects aged 2 to 59 in 14 or 15 geographic sites, different geographic sites. And so as part of the protocol, they do blood samples from every person at that baseline. This is stored. And so, so basically Zika plan is paying for the testing for Zika. So the beauty of this is you, have, uh, you can actually really monitor the geographic distribution, do age stratification, gender stratification, and really see what is happening in terms of the epidemiology in, of, of, of Zika in, in Brazil. Budantan is also taking blood after every year, I understand. So you can also determine your seroconversion rate and also the ratio of symptomatic to, to asymptomatic if we have enough money to also do those yearly things, which we may not uh, understand. Furthermore, at the end of the trial, we when, when the trial is unblinded, we can also look at data whether dengue, previous dengue or previous Zika has any impact on clinical disease because as you know, clinical disease is very, very well reported and whether the vaccine has any impact on any of those diseases. So I think this is a, it's, it's a golden treasure to me to have access to those samples. Um, lastly, Zika plan, um, you know, when we, when the call, the European Union call, <coughs> <coughs> was very much on um, addressing the knowledge gaps, but it, <coughs> but it really also stressed the fact that we need to work towards building a research capacity network. So to leverage on the Zika experience for preparation, pandemic preparation or research preparation for other emerging infectious diseases. So really, it was addressing Zika, but also looking beyond Zika. And we took this part very seriously in that call. And, um, and one of the interventions that we are looking at is, for example, looking at uh, interventions. Uh, looking at interventions uh, to, to, um, to protect against Aedes transmitted diseases. So we all know vector control has failed by and large, Wolbachia is, is the future. What can we do now, scalable, to, for personal protection? And uh, here we benefited, leveraged upon a study that we actually did under a previous consortium that I led called Dengue Tools, where we looked at dengue. And so the idea is, um, Aedes are day-biting mosquitoes. Um, for malaria, at night, night biting mosquitoes, we were successful in using insecticide impregnated bed nets. So what can we do during the day for personal protection? Now, these are the, the, not the data from um, Thailand. And as you see, the, for dengue, the highest incidence is in, those, is in, in school age children. What do children do during the day? They go to the school. What do they wear? They all wear uniforms. So how about impregnating 
uh, these school uniforms. So we um, did a large um, cluster randomized controlled school-based trial where the clusters were the intervention schools versus the control schools um, and, and, and looked at the incidence of dengue. So the clinic endpoint was dengue. To cut a long story short, this was probably my biggest community-based trial I've ever done. Incredible amount of work, sending out these uniforms, making sure they are impregnated without a smell and, and all blinded, etc., randomized. And uh, the end result, in short, was um, we enrolled more than uh, 2,000 children, but there was no impact. So there was no difference in the attack rate, negative trial. Why? In contrast to the uh, promises of the company that had given us those um, proprietary impregnated, permethrin impregnated clothing and said it would withstand 70 washes, we, did, uh, we actually investigated in, in a lab and we saw a rapid washout, washout of the permethrin. So basically, the, the reason was a rapid washout of permethrin within five to ten washes. Now, tie uniforms, you know, they are they're washed almost every day, right? So negative trial. So now in Sika Plan, we have not given up on the idea because the hypothesis, the concept, I believe, is a good one. Uh, so now the London School has taken it on to investigate new wash-resistant technologies that are to, uh, and, and are investigating those fibers that or contain normal silica shells that can be weaved into clothing and can be maintained over multiple washes. And we're using cone tests, arm and cage tests, et cetera, to show the amount of, of washing resistance because the idea for Sika would be to use it as maternity clothing. Five minutes. Five minutes for maternity. So ma maternity clothing, you also need to show it's not toxic. So we're also doing toxicity studies. Networks, networks, networks. So really one of the focus was uh, because we felt we had to go beyond Zika and really build up a capacity building, we're spending a lot of our time and money, not so much in science, but also network building. And so we have a birth defect surveillance network where we're bringing the Latin American network called ECLAM together with the European network. We have built, uh, we have developed manuals, software tools, even a new tablet app coded for Zika and with pictorial, um, so that even non-trained uh, birth attendants can recognize um, uh, congenital Zika syndrome. We have, as I said, this network for neurological complications. We have an evaluation platform, a laboratory network. We also set up a vector hub, which is an online registry of all countries. It's accessible, it's, it's, it's interactive, to really try to monitor and report on, on all the uh, on different vectors in different countries, but also on vector response um, systems that we have. And then lastly, because GBS is so, Guillain-Barré syndrome is so rare, um, we, are, we are leveraging on an existing network called IGOS, which is the International GBS Outcome Study, uh, which initially, before Zika, was really a rich country kind of network, and now is including um, countries that are reporting GBS, so we can really monitor a very rare disease outcome. And the biggest network then that we're doing is called Ready. Ready is a, both a Portuguese and a Spanish word, I was told, for network. And so we're trying to build another online system for Ready, uh, really is aiming to have core centers of research, of clinical studies that prepare for clinical trials in case there's another outbreak, we have regional centers, we do workshops, we have mentoring schemes, we have um, collect, uh, um, uh, we, we have uh, uh, monitoring schemes, uh, training sessions, online courses. Here you can see all the online courses that is now on, all available for free on the online platform of the Global Health Network. You can look up yourself, and this is all funded by the European Commission. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>